Hello, everybody. I'm Lori Fernandez, and this is One Mind Brainwaves. It's sometimes referred to as the baby blues, but it's all too often much larger and much more serious than that and can last a lot longer. Many new mothers struggle with stress, anxiety, and depression before, during, and after pregnancy, and they're not alone. Fathers can experience it too. Two people who understand that firsthand join us today. Their story... Their own personal story has led them on a mission to advance the science, provide better care for women, and combat the stigma surrounding postpartum depression and other perinatal mood disorders. Later in our One Mind Cyber Guide segment, we'll learn about some digital mental health resources for new mothers and expecting mothers. And stick around. We'll also give you a preview of our 27th annual music festival for brain health coming up on September 11th. Registration is open now for the in-person event in Napa Valley, California, and for the live stream virtual event um, at locations all around the country. One of the things you get to enjoy, the sweet sounds of our first guest. He is one of the finest pianists of his generation. He's also a composer, band leader, and longtime member of the Grammy-winning Branford Marsalis Quartet. Jazz musician Zoe Calderazzo joins us now. Joey, welcome to Brainwaves. Hey, how are you? It's good to be Doing here. Doing really well. How are you? Good, thank you. Thanks for joining us. So throughout your career, you've played alongside a number of incredible, great jazz artists. Um, but you started out as something of a child prodigy yourself. So how were you first introduced to jazz and what drew you to this sophisticated genre of music at such a young age? Um, I was in a rock band and my brother is a drummer who is four years older than me. And the bass player and the guitar player were four years older than me. So I, I was 14. They were all 18. <laughs> the guitar player went for a summer program in Boston at the Berklee School of Music, which is, you know, well known as being a jazz school. At least it was back then. And he came home and he was like, we got to start playing jazz. So we went from this rock band to a jazz band. And that was it. And then I just started buying jazz records. The following year, they were on their way to college. They all went to Berkeley School of Music. So I used to go up there and visit them on all my breaks. You know, like, you know, in February, we had a week off and I'd always go up there. And that is actually where I met Branford Marcellus. I was 14 years old. So I've known Branford since I was 14 and I'm now 56. Wow, that, yeah. that's a long time. <laughs> Um, oh, I'm, I'm glad you guys are, you know, we're able to keep in touch. And, and that's a wonderful story. You know, it's not often that you get people like that that stick around for a while. So um, thanks for sharing that. You're known for your improvisational high octane playing. Did this come naturally? Um, and how did your style evolve? Uh, um, probably because I loved bands like Led Zeppelin. The Who, I love the Beatles, um, you know, progressive groups like Yes and Emerson, Lake and Palmer. I mean, Keith Emerson was my idol. And um, I think, you know, I was a huge Led Zeppelin fan. So I think probably loving that kind of powerful group made me want to have that kind of, you know, style in jazz and and then throw, you know, ADHD in the mix and there, voila, you got me. <laughs> so. Oh, that, listen, my dad is a big jazz fan. And every time I hear jazz music, I, I have like synesthesia or chromesthesia. So I, I see color when I hear sound. And every time I hear jazz, I'm going to tell you, there's a big party happening up here. So. Um, well, I, I also want to add what was, um, you know, I went through a small phase of, you know, fusion, which would be, you know, like Chick Corea's Return of Forever and Herbie Hancock's Headhunters and Weather Report, which was sort of a jazz rock period that kind of took place in the 70s. So that was also a gateway for me. But I kind of went from like Led Zeppelin to John Coltrane. So I and John Coltrane had a very powerful quartet. So I sort of really gravitated towards that. And um you know, but it's been a work in progress. So now I, I work on music from the 30s, you know, and 40s. So I'm 
trying to, you know, continue to grow. Gotcha. It sounds like they really inspired you then. Yes. Um, we're going to get a taste of that beautiful style in just a minute. You and your bandmate, the wonderful Branford Masalas, have put together a special performance for the live stream of the Music Festival for Brain Health. We have a clip from a piece called Liza. Yeah. So what have you and Branford learned from each other about jazz? Oh, um, well, I've learned Branford knows more stylistic things about music than I do, but I know more harmony and, and um, more, uh, you know, of uh, theory based stuff. You know, I know more about chords. I know more about scales and chords and Branford has helped me, you know, cause Branford can play a little bit of everything. So, you know, he would he'd be like, we're, we're going to New Orleans and we're playing all New Orleans music. And I was like, I don't know New, More New Orleans music. He's like, here's the music and here, go listen to this record. And then we get together and he'd be like, you know, my dad would do this. He's like, try and do that. And I'd be like this. He's like, yeah, that's it. Do that. And so, I mean, I learned. And Branford also, the, one of the greatest lessons I ever got was, um, which a lot of mus musicians don't do this. You know, we'll be out playing in front of 2,000 people and Branford will just turn around because we don't have a set list. We just, whatever we, you know. So he'll turn around and be like, this was the song. He said, let's play dancing cheek to cheek, which is an old standard, right? Um, and I was like, I don't know it. He's like, you'll learn it. And I learned it on the spot in front of, you know, thousands of people. And, you know, and it just, I had to just sit there and, and try and figure out the song. And it was not a typical jazz song where it's usually like, you know, eight bars, the same eight bars, then maybe another eight bars, and then the old eight bars again, which is a typical AABA form, which is the typical standard form. This was a different, this was different. It was elongated, and then there was, you know, another section, and then there was actually a third section before it returned. So after, you know, after a couple of minutes, I kind of got it. And yeah, so it's the greatest. And I'll never forget the song because of the way I learned it. So that sounds terrifying. <laughs> I got over it quickly. Yeah. I, I played with a guy named Michael Brecker, who was one of the greatest saxophone players who died um, in 2007. And, um, Everything with Michael, we always sort of knew. We'd improvise, but we knew the songs and we knew, you know, we were very clear on what we were playing and it was rehearsed. Um, Branford, we've never rehearsed. We don't, we don't rehearse. We just, I have a new song, fine, we'll play it tonight. And that's kind of it. And yeah. As someone so, it, who it, trains like years and hours and hours just for a minute and 30 seconds of live competition television, the thought of going out there and not rehearsing something sounds like. Well, I mean, look, I wouldn't want to, I work on classical pieces and I, I practice those to death. I would never go out there and wing it, yeah, but, course. but we're really good at what we do. And it is, a, and jazz is, you know, it's an improvisational thing. And if I miss something, I'm not going to get lost. As long as I continue to keep my place, it's fine. And honestly, it's, um, there's something extremely liberating in that. You know what I mean? Cause it, it challenges you to actually find something else, you know, like I'm in this unknown space, you know, and what do I do in this unknown space? Oh my God. You know, so if you freak out, you do this, but if you just say, Hey, I'm here. What the hell? You know, and, and it's something, it's pretty cool. I love that. Um, to those listening, Brentford and Joey doing their thing. Here's Liza.
That was some hot stuff. Thank you, Joey. Viewers, you can see Joey and Brimford's performance in its entirety at the Music Festival for Brain Health live stream September 11th. For tickets, visit www.music-festival.org. The Music Festival raises money for brain health research and sparks critical conversations surrounding mental health, like the one that we are about to have today. Joining me now, we have Arielle Schatz Wilderman, is the president and founder of the Wilderman Fund for Maternal Mental Health. Her husband, Dr. Michael Wilderman, is the vice president of, of the Wilderman Fund. He's also a practicing vas- vascular surgeon and is the chief of endovascular surgery at Hackensack University Medical Center. So, Ariel and Michael, welcome to Brainwaves. Hi, thank you for all having us. So, um, Ariel, my first question is for you. This is such an important conversation about a serious health issue that is often overlooked. The birth of a baby can be a traumatic experience, both physically and mentally. Who is most at risk for perinatal mental health conditions like depression? And what are the main symptoms? Perinatal mood and anxiety disorders, um, also commonly known as postpartum depression, are the most common complication of childbirth in America. And one of the main risk factors that we know, like with any mental illness, is having a prior history of any mental um, illness in the family or a a history of any um, mental illness or or psychological struggle in the family. But when it comes to um, perinatal mood and anxiety disorders, um, we also know that just by virtue of being a woman puts us at an automatic 20% risk that we will go on to develop some form of true clinical Um, disorder surrounding the reproductive experience. Um, Perinatal mood anxiety disorder, perinatal, because it's really encompassing the entire reproductive uh, experience. So prenatal, antenatal, and postnatal or postpartum really combines the entire cycle of the really uh, the pregnancy. And it's not just when a live baby is born. This also will happen to women who've had miscarriages. Um, This happens to women going through IVF who may not be able to get pregnant or who may not even have access to um, help in getting pregnant. Um, And there are stillbirths. It doesn't always result in a healthy baby. So common symptoms um, of depression are crying, weeping, um, guilt, shame, silence, um, feeling stigmatized, um, just that really dark, heavy depression feeling. Um, And then also anxiety, postpartum anxiety, perinatal anxiety and obsessive compulsive disorders is extreme anxiety, intrusive thoughts, unwanted thoughts. These thoughts are really surrounding the baby. These are very specific um, events that have changed since the birth or the pregnancy. Um, experience. So um, also, you know, can can get as extreme as in psychosis, where uh, a woman uh, may experience full blown uh, psychotic episode, delusion, hallucination. Um, So again, but we're, we're really looking at those classic depression symptoms as primary symptoms that really will affect people throughout any course of their experience of postpartum depression. Thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, Let's talk about your own story. As a family, you struggled to overcome perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. What was your experience like surrounding the birth of your child? Childbirth was the most dehumanizing and, and humiliating event of my life. And thankfully, I had a normal, healthy baby. Um, but like I said, in my core, I wasn't ready to become a mother. Um, I really didn't want to be a mother, Um, but I was really focused on this loving husband of mine and creating a beautiful family and enjoying our lives together. Um, But when I was married, um, shortly thereafter, I moved to a new town where I had no social support. I didn't know anybody there. I had no friends. Um, And in spite of Michael's having a nice social group and a very successful work life, um, that got me instant relationships and meeting people and and having a thriving social life. But it wasn't mine. It wasn't my support system. And um, then within weeks of having moved, I changed all of my doctors to local. And I was diagnosed with a kind of infertility and found I couldn't get pregnant on my own. So that caused me to become detached. Um, And I went really from there, that very moment through the motions of um, time to get pregnant, we're going to have a baby. Um, And I just really wasn't ready for the whole thing until I experienced this traumatic blow. 
um, I felt like a failure. Obviously, I, I have not had any kids, so I can't in terms of relate to your experience at all. But someone that I love very, very much, very dearly, has been with me ever since I was a child. Um, she had found out that she wasn't able to have kids and went through IVF. Um, and before doing the process, had tried for about two years. And it was heartbreaking watching this person that I loved so much kind of go through this experience because I there's nothing that I could do except hold her hand through it the whole time. And, and I just wanted to show up and save the day and I couldn't. Um, and thankfully IVF was successful and, and we have a cute little nugget wandering around the earth right now. Um, but I know that the experience and the checking monthly was traumatizing and intrusive and invalidating and just so vulnerable in a, in a way that she didn't want it to be. Um, and so I can't imagine, you know, even being able to look back on the story and, and share it with the public. It is terrifying. And I can tell you right now that those that are listening are going to be very grateful for your words because they're going to hear you speak and they're going to say, damn, I went through the same thing. Thank God I'm not the only one who's doing this. Like, cause it's, it's terrifying to be alone. So just know that your, your words and everything you share is appreciated. Well, thank you. And thanks for getting me back on. Um, and, and I can tell you that, um, really, it was that loneliness and shame um, that I felt that um, without having support um, and, and I felt worthless and undeserving of the life that I had after this infertility diagnosis. Yeah. Um, but on top of which, you know, we experienced trauma and, and moving forward, not even a year from this infertility diagnosis, Michael tragically and wrongfully lost his father. He died suddenly, tragically. Um, and from there forward really became, um, I developed irrational thoughts. Um, I had this belief in my head um, that a son would help my husband and my family heal. Um, thankfully, IVF for me worked the first time. Um, and I looked like a perfect image of health, um, you know, but it, it was beautiful pregnancy. Everyone couldn't be happier pregnant with a boy. But behind the scenes, I was consumed by a debilitating paranoia and fear that I would even have a miscarriage, which again, mm -hmm. came back and symbolized that sudden sad death. Um, and I would no longer be bringing back a life to replace that sadness with the joy of a baby. Um, then at that point, I became hypervigilant through my pregnancy. Um, I was obsessed with time. I was obsessed with order. Um, whenever Michael was at work, uh, I was miserable. Um, I was lonely and in social, in, in, with friends, I never said a thing. Everything looked perfect. You would have never known. I attended events. I hosted parties. I volunteered. I completed graduate school. You would have never known. Uh, but I can tell you that the childbirth experience to me was by far the most unlivable, um, dehumanizing, um, horrifying uh, experience of my life. Um, and I can tell you that when I tell this story, I do like to offer a trigger warning because I will refer to some very, very violent um, and horrifying um, words or events that could trigger someone. So I do like to give a trigger warning. Um, but to me, childbirth really felt like there were men over my body. Um, telling me to keep going, but I was writhing to get out of these monitor wires. I felt breathless. I felt defeated. I was afraid that I was doing it wrong. I was afraid that I was, I didn't know how to deliver the baby. I was afraid that I would kill the baby if I didn't do what the doctor told me to do. Um, I was ashamed of my naked, helpless body, but I was too embarrassed to say anything. I was too embarrassed to say how I felt um, and I thought childbirth, really, I thought it was going to be glamorous, like in the movies. Um, and I think it probably looked like that for everyone else in the room. But after 22 hours of labor, um, I delivered a beautiful, healthy, perfect boy. Thank goodness. Um, everyone was celebrating that baby, congratulating Michael. But I, at that point, had completely checked out. Um, I felt violated. Um, I felt um, like my heart rate was dropping. I wish they would have just let me go. 
um, and I needed a lot of stitches. Um, I didn't know that I could ask for anesthesia. I didn't know that I could ask for help. I didn't know that I could say, hey, wait a minute, hold on. This is, I need anesthesia. I mean, just the pain that we go through and we think we have to go through that to produce this child. Um, I do remember um, feeling my heart rate drop. Um, I wish they would have just let me let me go. Um, but I was afraid that if something happened to me, or I didn't do what my doctor said that I would that I would die. And then this poor child would have no mother. Um, but really, the worst part of childbirth was that the placenta didn't all come out. And what that meant was I needed a manual extraction. And what this manual extraction really means is that my doctor put his hand through my pelvis into my very expanded uterus and, and to manually remove placenta that it adhered to the wall of my uterus. And if you can imagine that shame of, um, it was, I felt not like a mother, but I felt like a gutted whale. And I felt like my parts had been harvested and I was left to die alone. I felt violated, I was silenced, I felt abused, and I felt tortured. I had been robbed, I was robbed of the joy that comes with becoming a mother. And I was a woman stripped of my dignity. I was victimized and I was left behind for the baby. I believed that it was my fault, that I was bad, and then I just had to suck it up. Yeah, that's, that's unfortunately, that is a very real experience. And it is chalked up that childbirth is this perfect rosy um, or like rose colored glasses experience. But that is more often than not, not the case for anybody out there. Um, and I'm really sorry that it felt like you had to do such hard things alone. And, you know, are, are you know, I'm sure again, it's hard, but you're, you're now able to talk about it and, and share that with the world. And other people can now know, hey, like, it's okay to ask for help. It's, it's okay to, um, to verbalize that I need something, especially knowing that you're, you're bringing a child into the world. Um, I actually, I would love to bring Michael in. I have a couple questions for you. Um, being a new parent is supposed to be, you know, the happiest time in your lives, right? Uh, what was it like to watch someone you love suffer in this way? And, and how did it affect you as her, her husband? Um, so it was a terribly uh, challenging situation because um, I, again, had never done this before, but you have this idea whether from friends, family, the, you know, TV, whatever it is about how great everything is supposed to be and how the, the day a child is born, both mother, father and parent uh, and child are all instantly bonded. And it was, I was very happy and elated, but at the same time, I recognized that something wasn't totally right either. And the challenge for me was, I didn't even realize what was going on as far as Ariel's health, because while she was quiet, you hear stories of, oh, well, they're just going through the baby blues or they're going through uh, this challenging time or um, breastfeeding can be hard for people. Not everybody needs to breastfeed or, um, you know, when you don't sleep a lot at night, everybody is a little either depressed or cranky or tired or anxious or or doesn't want to do anything. Um, but uh, at some point, uh, it became recognizable to me uh, that there was a problem. And, um, and so while I wanted to be happy for this wonderful, healthy child that we had, uh, I was also very scared and concerned for the health of my wife. And one of the challenges that we faced was finding the right kind of help because these are things that people don't talk about. The, despite having, um, being a physician and having access to lots of kinds of care, there wasn't a lot of care. And, and even going through IVF, it's a very anxiety provoking um, situation. And there were lots of opportunities that we, if programs existed, that maybe we could have had different kinds of support at the front end to say, hey, 
Ariel, Michael, you're not alone. Here's another couple just like you that's going through similar things. And then you talk and communicate and, and, and it, can, it, it may not solve the problem, but at least you don't feel as alone. And so one of the challenges that we had was not just suffering, and we both suffered, right? There's, there's challenges on both sides, but finding the help that we needed to get. And just to add on to that, um, like he said, with the scarcity of care, um, just to go back a little bit about the postpartum depression and to really describe that uh, is that perinatal mood and anxiety disorders, like I was saying, postpartum depression is the most common complication of childbirth in the United States. It affects about 20% of women each year. Um, but uh, untreated perinatal mood and anxiety disorders strip women of their dignity. They inflict toxic stress on families um, and they lead to generations of suffering. Um, suicide is the leading cause of death among newly postpartum women. Um, and despite this dangerously high prevalence in our society, 93% of women who are in need do not or cannot access the right care. Yeah, those are terrifying t statistics. Um, it's the priority of the mother's health needs to be on par with the child's health. I mean, sleep deprivation is linked to suicidal ideation in mothers with postpartum depression. And so when the baby's crying at night and you're not able to sleep or the baby needs to eat or be changed and you're not able to sleep, or there's that anxiety of like, I don't want something to happen to my kid without me knowing, like, I want to be awake. I want to be there for this. But at the same time, it, it robs you of the independency of having those basic human needs, which is sleeping and eating and having time to yourself. So it definitely, um, that is a tough experience. Absolutely. Tough is not even the right word for it, but that is a very harsh and brutal experience. Um, sometimes, um, you know, Michael, going back to mothers with postpartum and, and their partners, it's not, sometimes it's, it's the opposite. Sometimes it's not the mother and the mother can be great with the child, but it's the partner. Um, how prevalent are these conditions in the non-birthing parent and what are some of the risk factors? Um, or like, are men also likely to try and hide their own depression with a child coming into the world and, and avoid seeking help for that? Um, so I do think, so I think it's, it's roughly 10% of partners uh, are affected. And I think, um, at least in my case, I felt like um, whatever anxiety or stress or uh, I might have been feeling, I felt like I had to keep it in bottled up because uh, I felt it was one, um, there's obviously shame and stigma associated with, with all of this. And two, I felt like um, I had to do more as Ariel was suffering uh, through uh, what she was going through. And so whatever I was feeling or, or dealing with just became a non, uh, just was compartmentalized and put away. Well, and if I can just add on to that, um, again, this whole image and this whole social um, expectation of the ethereal cloud of motherhood and the Pampers baby commercials, um, diaper commercials, where there's, you know, this precious baby, you know, this is all very true. Babies are the gift. Babies are the most precious thing I could imagine, children. But in day-to-day -day life, what he was going through as well is in my postpartum depression, um, another thing that we face is when people want to see pictures of our baby. Okay, well, sure. Oh, here's a picture of my baby. For a person that's, that's normal, you're happy, you want to show your baby, but knowing that your partner or knowing that you and yourself doesn't want to show a picture of a baby, doesn't want to talk about the baby, holding the baby. Um, sometimes it was nice, but those moments would be short. I would become frustrated. I would be annoyed. Michael witnessed all of this. Um, I tried to fake it for Michael. I tried to fake it for the world around me because I was so afraid that my detachment would scar my son for life. And it was ruining my family's dynamic. Um, but I actually didn't know it was happening to me. Um, like you said, this was not sustainable, um, but I actually never knew that I was in the throes of postpartum depression 
until really it became so debilitating that I could not continue on with the course of my daily life. Yeah, absolutely. For those that are listening, just a guest reminder, we're talking today about postpartum depression and other perinatal mood disorders with Arielle Schatz Wilderman. She's the president and founder of the Wilderman Fund for Maternal Mental Health and the fund's vice president, her husband, Dr. Michael Wilderman. He's also a practicing vascular surgeon and is the chief of endovascular surgery at Hackensack University Medical Center. Viewers, as always, we want to hear from you. If you know anyone who can benefit from the information provided by our guests today, please share this webcast with them. Michael, we talked a moment ago about stigma. How does the medical profession in general view these perinatal postpartum conditions? I think the medical profession in general views all mental illness, whether it's postpartum or, or nothing to do with pregnancy related mental illness, uh, their stigma associated with it. And I think um, that's one of the reasons that I was so encouraging of Ariel to start her foundation because we need to smash stigma and not just provide care, but we need to also make people aware and society uh, understanding that it's okay to be depressed. It's okay to be anxious or have an anxiety disorder or any other mental illness. It's not your fault. Uh, and you just need to find the appropriate care. Yeah, absolutely. Ariel and Michael, you've launched the innovative Wilderman Center for Maternal Mental Health. How can your program serve as a model for other facilities and communities? Sure. I mean, first of all, just it's about a culture of healthcare. Um, one thing that our experience learned um, is that um, we collaborate. Once I got better and started this foundation, we had to do our research. We were not interested in reinventing any wheels here. We believe in collaboration. So our personal experience with my suffering through perinatal mood and anxiety disorders led us to collaborate, to find the leaders, the experts in the field. We did our research. We identified fundamental barriers to the care that Michael was speaking of. And we found gaps in the perinatal mental health system. But we actually, de de uh, there was no defined system. There is no standard of care for perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. Unlike other medical problems, there's not for pet. So the stigma. Stigma perpetuates silence. Problems get swept under the rug. But also, uh, moving forward, there's a basic lack of clinical knowledge, experience, and education and resources. So this sort of education and scientific insufficiency yields competition for providers, organizations, hospitals, anyone working in the mental health field um, and the medical field. And typically what a big problem um, that we're trying to address and help to um, close is the um, working in silos, working individually to try to outdo each other, to try to be the next and the best and the greatest and the, but specialized care uh, cannot be available when everybody is operating their own little world here. There's no collaboration, there's no progress. Um, and again, like I said, 93% of women um, will not get access in spite of their backgrounds to the healthcare that they need. Um, so our, our goal with, with the foundation uh, that Ariel started was three sort of parts. The first is for people who, are, um, who cannot uh, find care or have access to care, we can help support programs to provide care. And then the second big issue or, or sort of pillar that we're looking to tackle is because there's such a scarcity of comprehensive care, uh, our goal is to actually help build for institutions or places that want to set up a perinatal mental health uh, center or clinic. We can help through education programs and funding to start those um, centers because there's really, a, you know, a tremendous scarcity throughout the entire country. Uh, and so women and their families cannot get access to the care that they need, um, either because they're afraid to speak about it, or even if they speak about it, there isn't really a place to go. 
And the doctors don't have, uh, not just doctors, but providers and our community and people in general. And we don't even talk about it enough when we're pregnant, but the resources for providers, even just understanding how to have a conversation, different ways of asking the same kinds of questions. If you ask a new mother who's crying and doesn't want to hold the baby, oh, do you have thoughts of harming your baby? Which doctors do ask these questions? Do you have thoughts of harming yourself? Do you have thoughts of harming your baby? There's a different way to have that conversation. No one's going to say yes, because we're afraid that they'll admit us and take away our children. It's a very scary situation to be in, but the providers need to be able to have that conversation and knowledge is power in order to give the best patient care. Absolutely. A good start on what we hope will be many conversations about this important and overlooked topic. Thank you both for sharing such a harsh story. And I know that no matter what words you use, it was harder for both of you because you experienced it. So I think all of us listening are aware that um, the the empathetic pain that we hear just listening, it, it was just more because you experienced it. So thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you for shedding light on this. Um, we're actually going to go to the lighting round. We're towards the end of this um, this chat that we've had today. So we're going to do five questions, quick answers, one person at a time. We're going to start with Michael first and then circle around for Ariel's answers. Are you guys ready? Mm-hmm. Okay. First question, what helps you cope when you're going through a tough time mentally? Uh, communication with my wife, with my friends, and with my family. What type of music, literature, or art do you turn to when you're feeling down? There are certain songs over the course of my life that have, you know, tend to pick me up, and so I tend to listen to those. Mm. A hobby or activity that helps you unwind and de-stress? Exercise. Yes. The number one change you'd like to see in the way people think about motherhood and childbirth? Um, that it's a serious situation, and... It's uh, not as easy as uh, the commercials make it out to be. For sure. And our last one, what gives you hope? My wife. No. All righty. Are you ready for yours? Yes. Thank you. What helps you cope when you're going through a tough time mentally? Again, communication, being really raw, being really real. Yeah. Talking about it. What type of music, literature, or art do you turn to when you're feeling down? Sure. So as a violinist, also from St. Louis, loved jazz. Thank you, Joey. I don't know if you're still on. Um, <laughs> love the Marsalis Brothers. Um, improvisational things in general, um, figuring things out, puzzles. I love uh, mind tricks. I love classical music, jazz music. I love I love hip hop. I love anything you can break dance to. Um, And I sing in the car really loud. Same. Same here. (laughs) A hobby or activity that helps you unwind and de-stress? Sure. So I practice Muay Thai and Thai style martial arts. I've been doing this since my son was six months postpartum, which really helped me uh, get through it a lot. And he's now seven. So I'm really committed to that. Um, But also um, art and um, singing and dancing, any kind of music that you can break dance to, I will listen to hip hop, um, freeing my mind. Um, and sometimes it's as simple, honestly, the best is just looking at my son and seeing brightness in his eyes. Absolutely. The number one change you'd like to see in the way people think about motherhood and childbirth. Oh, for me, sorry. Mm-hmm. Um, again, it's not like the movies. Um, like anything else in life, life happens and we can't always be prepared for it. But motherhood and having a baby or being pregnant is different and special for everyone. And we have to respect that everyone's experience is not the same experience. Empathy really counts for a lot. Empathy absolutely does. Our last one, what gives you hope? Well, like the word empathy I just said is science and creating a culture of empathy um, and understanding about mental health, um, in our case, perinatal mental health through medicine and science. Um, And the more we can do with innovation and medical care um, in learning about and studying and innovating in the field of maternal mental health, 
Um, I believe that science helps to validate the kind of empathy that we wish to bring into the healthcare experience as a whole. And I know that we can do that. That gives me hope. Um, conversations like these today, empathy and science gives me hope and my son and my husband. Yay. Thank you both, Ariel and Michael. Um, that was a heavy conversation, but it's one that is not had enough. And I'm grateful that it was you two who I was allowed to talk to today and chat with. Um, I'm super grateful. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for having us. Absolutely. Now, our team at One Mind Cyber Guide is here to tell us about a digital resource for managing the mental and emotional challenges that can come along with the arrival of a new baby. Hello, my name is John Bunny, and I'm a digital mental health specialist at One Mind Cyber Guide. We spend lots of time talking to people about mental health apps, what they like about them and what they don't like about them. In our research, we've heard from lots of people that one barrier to using mental health apps are concerns about privacy and security. This is understandable, as in some cases you might be entering sensitive private information about your well-being, which you don't want other people to see. Just like any other technology you use, you should only use apps you trust and are confident in their ability to protect your data. Any app you use should have a privacy policy that informs you about how the app handles your data. In a recent study, we found that over half of apps for depression don't have a privacy policy. You can check for a policy in the App Store at the bottom of the app page. If an app doesn't have a policy or you are unsure of the security of the app, avoid using it. At One Mind Cyber Guide, we review privacy policies to check if key pieces of information about what happens to your data are covered in the policy. We believe developers should be as transparent as possible about how they handle data so you can make informed choices about the apps you use. Today we're featuring the Mothers and Babies online course from Dr. Elin Barrera. The Mothers and Babies online course is based on a group intervention developed by Dr. Ricardo F. Munoz and colleagues. It's based on principles of cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT. The course is available in both English and Spanish. It's designed to be used by anyone pregnant women, new mothers, and also those who support expecting a new mothers. The program consists of a series of lessons covering five main areas, learning about emotional experiences that women can encounter during and after pregnancy, understanding our thoughts and how it impacts how we feel, understanding how our behaviors affect how we feel, learning about the importance of relationships, and practicing relaxation exercises. Each lesson provides educational content and tools such as mood tracking skills. You can also access the tools presented throughout the course in the resources section at any time. The program is designed to help teach skills for managing stress related to motherhood and changes in how you feel during and after pregnancy. It also helps build healthy relationships with your newborn baby or other children. Learn more about the Mothers and Babies online course by visiting www.emb.health. You can also find more information about cognitive behavioral therapy at onemindcyberguide.org under Mental Health Resources and Managing Mental Health. You can find other digital cognitive behavioral products by visiting our app guide and selecting Cognitive Behavioral Principles. Stay tuned next week for another app review. Thank you, CyberGuide team. Thank you to Joey Calderazzo and his colleague, Branford Marsalis, Dr. Michael Wilderman, and Ariel Schatz-Wilderman. Viewers, thank you too. Don't forget you can post questions and also check out all of our Brainwaves episodes at onemind.org slash brainwaves. We mentioned earlier tickets are on sale for One Mind's 27th annual music festival for brain health. Visit www.music-festival.org. As we leave you, here's a preview. Bye, everyone, and have a great day.